DW, World in Progress. With Sarah Stephan. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Sarah Stephan. 85 years ago, on December 2nd, 1938, 200 Jewish children arrived in Great Britain from Germany. It was the first of many so-called Kindertransport rescue missions. It's German for children's transport. The children were brought out of Nazi Germany to safety. Our headmaster, he decided, or he tried anyway, to bring the whole school to England. If one considers that Kristallnacht was November 1938, in a matter of two months, he managed to organize uh, people in England to receive us, also to persuade the parents to let their children go to England. That gentleman there, who you just heard speaking, is one of these children who managed to escape back then. Kurt Marx was put on a train by his parents at the age of 13. Until September 1st, 1939, when Nazi Germany attacked Poland and World War II started, around 10,000 miners were brought to safety that way. But for other children, it was too late. I mean, Pa was always sad when he talked about this, because the last train that he organized of 250 children never left, because that was the day that Hitler marched in. And he always, I think, reflects on what he didn't manage to do rather than what he did manage to do. And then there's the question why the parents were left behind. Many children never saw them again. Many were murdered by the Nazis. Right from the start in the House of Commons, the Home Secretary, Sir Samuel Hawes, said, you know, it's going to create horrible dilemmas for the parents. So there's another question, you know, why not the adults? And of course, the adults in, in the government mind pose a sort of different type of threat. They're less sort of you know, harder to sell in the public sphere. So you know, the, the very, very evocative photographs of the children arriving with teddy bears or dolls or whatever at the ports, you know, it's, it's harder to replicate that with, with an, an adult male, for example. Reporter Gabby Biesinger went to talk to the former children who were saved by these transports abroad. She hears from the brave people and their families who tried to save as many lives as they could during the Nazi regime. Her in-depth feature is presented by Ben Russell. The synagogue on London's Hallam Street, housed in an unremarkable brick building, is easy to overlook. But today, over a dozen police officers are waiting outside the place of worship. Suddenly, a police motorcycle rushes forward, followed by a Bentley with the royal standard. King Charles gets out and is led into the synagogue. It's November 9th, 2023. Exactly 85 years ago, on November 9th, 1938, the Nazis launched an anti-Jewish pogrom, setting fire to synagogues and thousands of Jewish shops across Nazi Germany. It became known as the Kristallnacht, or Night of Broken Glass. In the weeks and months following the pogrom, Jewish parents scrambled to get their children to safety, putting them on trains heading elsewhere, all by themselves. Today, King Charles is about to meet some of them at the London synagogue. They're now in their 90s, or even older. Patiently, they wait for King Charles to arrive. Rabbi Ephraim Mervis welcomes His Majesty. Your Majesty, ladies and gentlemen, at this moment, parts of our world are broken. There is hatred, there is conflict, and there is a tragic war raging in Israel. Our world desperately needs outstanding exemplars of chesed, of loving kindness. And this is exactly what His Majesty the King is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Your Majesty, for being here today on the 85th anniversary of Kristallnacht, which inspired the Kindertransport Initiative. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your contribution towards healing our fractured world. A small plaque is unveiled to commemorate the King's visit. Charles sits down at one of the tables and begins talking to Court Marx. He arrived in England as a 13-year-old on the train from Cologne. 
I met Kurt a few weeks earlier for an interview at the German embassy in London, where he told me about his experience of the November pogrom. We had Kristallnacht, went to school on that morning of Kristallnacht, and when the school seemed to be burning, actually the school wasn't alight, but there was a synagogue next to the school which had been set alight. This started this idea of kinder transport. Our headmaster, he decided, or he tried anyway, to bring the whole school to England. If one considers that Kristallnacht was November 1938, in a matter of two months, he managed to organize uh, people in England to receive us, also to persuade the parents to let their children go to England. Because in general, people said, no, the children stay at home, we will stay together, we're not going to be parted. But luckily, my parents decided, yes, I could join. After leaving for England, Court never saw his parents again. Long after the war, Court learned that they had been deported to Minsk and murdered. Six days after the November pogrom, a group of Jewish representatives and Quakers contacted British Prime Minister Chamberlain, asking that Britain take in unaccompanied Jewish minors. They also promised to pay for the rescue effort. British Parliament agreed, and on November 25, 1938, Foreign Secretary Stanley Baldwin took to the airwaves, encouraging Britons to host the new arrivals. I ask you to come to the aid of victims not of any catastrophe in the natural world, not of earthquake, nor of flood, nor of famine, but of the explosion of man's inhumanity to man. The first train for London left Berlin on December 1, 1938, with almost 200 children on board. Over the next few months, a total of 10,000 children, most of them Jews, arrived in Britain. The so-called Kindertransporter continued until September 1, 1939, the day Nazi Germany invaded Poland, starting World War II. That's when the rescue operation came to an abrupt end. Professor Tony Kushner researches Jewish migration history at the University of Southampton. He says it's important to emphasize that the Kindertransport scheme was not a government initiative, but privately organized. Families who wanted to take in refugee children had to deposit 50 pounds, roughly equivalent to 3,000 euros in today's money, into a state bank account as a guarantee. And they had to pay for the children's everyday needs. The Kinder Transport has, in the last 20, 30 years, developed a special attention. And I think it is because the way it's presented is unchallenging to national mythology. And to some extent, the children themselves or the former children are happy to be part of that, to express their gratitude. I think it's important with the Kinder Transport that this was not a government scheme. It's often represented as such uh, in commemoration, including in the House of Commons itself. There is a memorial plaque in the British House of Commons commemorating the rescue of the children. Today, it's going to be bookended with the Kinder Transport at one end and the liberation of Belson at the other, which is a very celebratory account of Britain's record in the 30s and especially in the Second World War. So it sort of can fit national mythologies. Around 10,000 children were saved by the Kinder Transport rescue scheme. A considerable but small number compared to the 1.5 million children murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust. Many of the rescued children never saw their families again because they were murdered. So why did the British take in children, but no adults? The British government at the time recognised this dilemma, says Tony Kushner. Right from the start in the House of Commons, the Home Secretary, Sir Samuel Hawes, said, you know, it's going to create horrible dilemmas for their parents. So there's another question, you know, why not the adults? And of course, the adults in, in the government mind pose a sort of different type of threat. They're less sort of you know, harder to sell in the public sphere. So the, you know, the, the very, very evocative photographs of the children arriving with teddy bears or dolls or whatever at the ports you know it's it's harder to replicate that with with an, an adult male for example and those who agreed to take in children didn't always have the best intentions at heart 
But this isn't something that's been widely discussed. The children are treated in a huge variety of ways, and I think that reflects that, you know, unlike today where there is much more safeguarding of children and checking uh, you know, with refugees at houses and that homes are, are, uh, families are suitable for, uh, for that sort of fostering of children. Some of those homes were loving and caring and treated the children with enormous respect and awareness of the trauma they experienced, the separation. That's, you know, on one side. Uh, and then you've got on the other side, people who both exploit the children as a sort of child labour almost as domestic servants, uh, especially the ones who are a little bit older. Sexual abuse as well, the vulnerability of the children, and those you know, accounts are not totally rare. And it's, so there was a degree of conversionism as well. Uh, and then in the war, some of the older children, particularly the, but not exclusively the male children who are reaching sort of age 18, around that, are, are part of the general policy of internment, building that... Uh, we're talking in, uh, which is part of the University of Southampton, was for a couple of weeks an internment camp for the refugees in the neighbourhood, including one or two who were child refugees um, who had turned 18. Court Marx described a similar experience when we met at the German embassy. He had left school at 15 and had just started his first day of work at a factory when the foreman called him up to his office at lunchtime. Then he said, you can't work here. You're an enemy alien. You see, in the morning I was a Jewish refugee. Four hours later I was an enemy alien, which was quite a shock to me that I should become an enemy alien because there was a war. Kushner says that Germany devoted a lot of energy to reckoning with its Nazi past and with the Holocaust. But Britain, he says, has dedicated less attention to reflecting on its own homegrown anti-Semitism. I think the kind of transport has been written and almost performed as a morality story, um, where, where you have the obvious baddie, uh, the Nazis stroke the German people, depending on how nuanced you are. There is, you know, the the at the heart of of those discussions are how critical should we be, and there is, you know, a sort of if you like an official perspective which is more. Uh, celebratory and a more academic perspective, which is more critical. The Kindertransporter play a central role in the German-British culture of remembrance. During his trip to Germany in March 2023, King Charles visited the Kindertransport Memorial in Hamburg. One month earlier, the president of the German parliament, Bärbel Baas, met some former Kindertransport refugees in London. They had gathered by Liverpool Station's The Arrival sculpture. The bronze artwork shows five children with suitcases and teddy bears. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. This is Ingeborg Hamilton. Ingeborg Hamilton. Who oh, was a kinder. Hello. Hello. That's right. Nice to meet you. Pleasure. Baz thanked Britain for taking in the 10,000 children at the time, and a minute of silence followed for the many children and their families who were murdered. If you come from Germany, from the country of the perpetrators, it really touches me that I can't stand among you today and that we think about these very, very many children together. The meeting was co-organized by the Association of Jewish Refugees. The charity, founded in 1941, provides social and financial support for Jews who fled from Nazi Germany to Britain. At lunch, Babel Baas chatted with Kurt Marx, among others, and later told German public broadcaster ARD about her encounter. One of these safe children is a 97-year-old gentleman today. He proudly told me that his family had lived in Cologne for over 500 years. So they still have this connection to Germany, despite everything that happened that their parents or their families were murdered by Germans, by the Nazis. That they still look at their old homeland with pride. It's very, very impressive. These are important stories. And we always discuss how we maintain a culture of remembrance. So how can we continue to tell these stories? when these safe children are no longer with us. Despite his old age, Kurt still visits schools to talk about his experience as a Kindertransport refugee. 
I've spoken to several groups of children in Germany. I found they are very well educated about that period. They know much more than our children here about Holocaust, about what happened. As the years go by and more survivors pass away, books, music and films play an ever bigger role in telling their stories. It's Aachen. This is Aachen. This is Essen. We are slowing. It is the border. The last place. The edge. Papier! Papers! Documenta! Passports! Passports with a One such movie What's is One Life, a biographical drama coming to cinema soon. It tells the story of British stockbroker Nicholas Winton, who helped rescue 669 children from Czechoslovakia. Winton and his Prague helpers organized several train journeys to London, bringing young refugees to safety. Shortly before his death, he told the BBC what had motivated him. Ethics, goodness, kindness, love, honesty, decency, ethics. That's standard of life. I believe in ethics. And if everybody believed in ethics, we'd have no problems at all. Winton's story came to public attention in 1988, when he was invited onto the BBC's That's Life TV show. There, he was reunited with some of the many hundred Jewish refugees he once helped rescue from the Nazis. Among them, Vera Diamond. This is Vera Diamond, now Vera Gissing. We did find her name on his list. Vera Gissing is with us here tonight. Hello, Vera. And uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. <laughs> After the show, many more people came forward who had also been saved by Winton. And he was invited onto British television once more. Can I ask, is there anyone in our audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton? If so, could you stand up, please? The entire audience rose to their feet. On behalf of all of them, thank you very much indeed. In the years that followed, Winton stayed in contact with some of those he'd rescued, as well as their families. He received countless awards and honours, including for his charitable work. He died in 2015 at the age of 106. Historian Tony Kushner says it's understandable why Winton has become idolised as a hero, even though that's only one side of the story. You need to sort of create a narrative pattern which has got someone who is the hero figure. And I think people like Trevor Chadwick, who you know, has remained rather obscure in the story, uh, and is, whereas Winton was, uh, you know, sort of fitted the role of a, of a uh, kind, gentle soul, and which he was, a very decent man, uh, and was doing the hard paperwork at home. It was Chadwick who was a sort of rogue before uh, and then a rogue afterwards, uh, a lovable rogue, mainly, um, though you know, not without his major faults, uh, has been ignored in that story. And in the case of Winton, even though he's got part Jewish roots, he sort of fills that figure. And after a while, there was almost ran out of awards that you can give him. He didn't want the attention, I think it's fair to say. He really was um, surprised by it. Uh, whilst everyone else was sort of indifferent, he was the person we can grab hold of and say, look, this is what should have happened, and he did it, and we should honour, uh, which you know, was the case. Winton's friend, Trevor Chadwick, struggled with alcohol addiction all his life. He died of a stroke in 1979 and never received much recognition for his role in helping Winton with the Kindertransport rescue mission. But in 2022, a statue was put up in his Dorset hometown in honour of his efforts. One Life had its European premiere at the London Film Festival in autumn 2023. The movie title refers to the Talmud, which states that if you save one life, you save the whole world. A fitting title, says Winton's granddaughter Holly Watson. Every small action can help. Every small action can help snowball into a bigger action. Every one life is just as important. Save one life, save the world. That's why the film is called One Life. 
One movie scene depicts delays in getting a planned Kindertransport train moving because a British bureaucrat was on holiday at the time. A train set to bring 250 children to safety from Prague was delayed until September 1, 1939, the day Hitler invaded Poland. The train never left for Britain, and most of the children died. They would have survived had the train left just one day earlier. His father never forgave himself for that, said son Nick Winton. I mean, Pa was always sad when he talked about this because the last train that he organised of 250 children never left because that was the day that Hitler marched in. And he always, I think, reflects on what he didn't manage to do rather than what he did manage to do. So it's a little bittersweet. The screenwriters drew attention to this tragedy because it runs counter to the narrative that Britain did its utmost to make the Kindertransporter possible. Screenwriter Nick Drake. I think it is true. They would have saved many more children if the process of bureaucracy had been more amenable and more efficient. And that is a, that is a, a somber thought. Screenwriter Lucinda Coxon says not much has changed to this day. I mean, as today, there are many, you know, there are many different responses to that question. There are many people who are working very hard to try and help refugees. There are people who are trying to just grapple with the reality of how you might best do that. And there are people who, for their own reasons, are, are hostile to the idea. It's not really changed. 90-year-old Lord Alfred Dubbs also attended London's One Life premiere. He arrived in Britain on one of the Kindertransport trains organised by Winton. His mother also managed to flee to Britain shortly after him. Dubbs grew up in Manchester. He worked as an administrator and then served as a Labour MP. In 1994, he was appointed as a Labour Life peer. It's a great honour for somebody who arrived at Liverpool Station at the age of six in, in, in 1939 to suddenly be here and to be commemorating a person who did something so important and saved a lot of our lives, I think that's a great privilege. And it's wonderful the films we made about him because he was a very special person. And he didn't just say there's a problem, oh dear, and walk away. He said there's a problem and I'm going to do something about it. And that's what distinguishes him from other people. He says the film has an important message. Even though the film premiere was overshadowed by the October 7 attack on Israel a week prior, when Hamas, a terror organization, brutally murdered countless civilians. If the film is going to have any impact, it teaches something as to how we should behave better in the future. And, uh, and it's tragic what's happening now. I, I can hardly watch the news. It's, it's just so personally painful. A few days after the premiere, I meet Lord Dubbs in his small Westminster office. In the past years, he has campaigned extensively to protect underage refugees. In 2016, Dubbs proposed a legal amendment compelling Britain to take in unaccompanied minors, for instance from EU refugee camps. But when the amendment was adopted in the House of Commons, the Conservative Tory government used a trick to sabotage the bill, says Dubbs. They said, OK, they accepted the amendment, and then they... Um then they did a dirty thing. They said, we're going to limit it to a certain number, which is ridiculous. We never talked about that, 480. In 2022, around 45,000 migrants arrived in England by boat after crossing the English Channel, a small figure compared to other European countries. But the Conservative government has been set on deterring new arrivals at all cost. Former Home Secretary Suella Braverman said Britain faced a hurricane of migrants. And the government struck a deal to deport asylum seekers arriving across the English Channel to Rwanda, even though British courts have ruled the scheme unlawful because Rwanda could not be considered a safe third country. Uh, I, I think it was shocking, it was despicable, it was cheap, it was nasty politics. Um, it, it, it let Britain down, it, above all, it let the refugees down. Um, I mean, the most recent legislation says that if they come... If, if they come by an illegal means, defined by the government as if they come on a boat, that's not legal, and, and therefore they're not allowed to claim asylum. And that is something which, which is a breach of the 1951 Geneva Convention. That said, Dubbs thinks that Britain shouldn't be criticised for its role in the Kindertransporter back in 1938 and 39. I think the debates in Parliament were quite tough in 1938. I've read them. And, and some people didn't like the idea, but on the whole... On the whole, there was sympathy. 
uh, and so Parliament played a part in enabling it to happen. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I think Britain is to be commended rather than criticised. Yeah, it would have been, in an ideal world it would have been great, but that was not an ideal world. In 2015, shortly before his death, Nicholas Winton gave an interview to the BBC expressing his dismay at the state of the world. I think the world's gone absolutely balmy. We've gone through a hundred years of the greatest achievement that man's ever made, technically and in many other ways. And look what a mess we're in. Nothing much to be proud of, is so there? We've left the place in a more dangerous situation than it's ever been. And his granddaughter Holly Watson is certain that her late grandfather would have been angry with the British government's hardline stance on asylum seekers. Now we would understand that he thought that it was inadequate, which I, th I think is definitely the case. His work before the Second World War was a far bigger step than we've taken since then. And look how much he's lauded now for the work that he did then and look at the situation now. If we think that what he did then was such an amazing thing, how does that draw parallels with what's happening now? I think that's pretty clear. Nicholas Winton's granddaughter, Holly Watson, there. Ending that report by Gabby Biesinger, presented by Ben Russell. They're literally everywhere these days. But whether you like them or not, modern day life would be impossible without plastics. The growth trajectory of plastics is just, for, quite frankly, scary. By 2050, we will produce between three to four times as much plastics as we're producing today. But with growing production comes increased pollution. Plastic waste is accumulating in our oceans, rivers and forests at an alarming rate. And microplastics is not just being found in our food and water, but also in our bodies. The idea that microplastics could cross the blood-brain barrier it's just, it makes you shudder. So in this brand new series, I'll be taking a closer look at how we got here. I really think plastics is the, a tangible expression of all that is wrong with capitalism. And what's keeping us on the plastic drip? The core underlying fundamental problem to solve in the plastic world is that we live in a world where virgin plastic, new plastic, is cheaper than high quality recycled plastic. I'll also be exploring some impressive solutions that are on the table to clean up our plastic mess. From filtering microplastics out of water. The process is quite simple. You just add this adsorbent into the water, mix it 100%, remove all of the microplastic happens within one hour. To upcycling plastics into ingredients that we can actually eat. I wanted to break that plastic into its constituent um, parts, which we call monomers. And they took one of these monomers and converted it into the compound called vanillin. On the Green Fences new series on the world's growing plastic problem and solutions, wherever you get your podcasts. My colleague Neil King there with a new On the Green Fence plastic special. And you can find our radio shows and podcasts also on YouTube now. Just search for DW Podcasts. Or, as always, check us out via your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you name it, and we're there. Or again, we're on YouTube, DW Podcasts. That's our show for this week. Thanks to Ben Russell, who helped with this episode. The studio technician was Ziad Abu Sleiman. I'm your host, Sarah Steffen. Bye for now.